Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Innal hamdalillah nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina wa min sayyiati a'malina. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajim. Wa ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. أيها الأحبة السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين Why are you worshiping a mountain? Why are you doing this shit? Why are you wearing this thing to protect you from the aim, the evil eye or sehr? Why are you doing that? Zayd ibn Thabit said Wallahi, I'm not going to do anything that the Prophet didn't do Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He said Wallahi I'm not going to do anything that the Prophet didn't do, Abu Bakr and Umar. If the Quran was going to be a mushaf, the Prophet would have did it. I'm not doing that. He thought it was a bid'ah. He thought it was, I'm not doing that. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi amma ba'du. We'd like to take this opportunity out, inshallah, to discuss a very important issue that if a Muslim were to comprehend it and understand it, he would be extremely effective in worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal wahtuhu la sharika lahu. If the Muslim man or the Muslim woman doesn't understand this point, they're going to create a lot of problems from themselves, and they're going to be like the people that Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran concerning the Kufa of Quraysh. He said about them, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى حرف. From the people or those people who worship Allah, and they don't know what they're doing. They worship Allah with ignorance. They worship Allah based upon the culture. They worship Allah based upon guesswork. We want to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala based upon knowledge. Allah ta'ala told the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to say in the Quran, قُلْ هَذِ سَبِيلِ أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمِنِ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ وَمَا أَنَا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Tell them, Ya Muhammad, this is my way. This is my way. The Sirat al-Mustaqeem. This is al-Islam. I worship Allah with basira. I know what I'm doing. I worship Allah with ilm. And those people who follow me, meaning the Muslims. And we're not from the mushrikeen. The mushrikeen are the people who worship Allah Azza wa Jal. And they worship Allah based upon culture. They worship Allah based upon what we want to talk about, and that is at taqlid al-a'ma, blind following. Taqlid, it means for a person to take someone else's position, and they don't know why. They don't know the dalil. They just say, so-and-so did it, so I'm going to do it. My mother, my father did it, so I'm going to do it. And this is from the practice of two bad groups that are mentioned in the Quran. At taqlid is the practice of the kuffar Quraysh, Mushrikun, whether it's Quraysh, whether it's Americans, whether it's Russians, whether it's Chinese, the Mushrikeen, the people of the Shirk, they're the ones who say Isa ibn Allah. And when you say to them, as Allah said in the Quran, قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانُكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Bring your proof if Allah has a son. Where's the proof of that? They're going to only say, this is what my mother, my father taught me. So the people of the Shirk, they make a taqlid al-a'ma. The second type of people who make a taqlid al-a'ma are the Yahud and the Nasara, as it's been mentioned in so many ayat of the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that we're going to follow the ways of those people who came before us. لَتَتَّبِعُنَّ سُنَنَ مَنْ كَانَ قَبْلُكُمْ شِبْرًا بِشِبْرًا وَذَرَعًا بِذَرَعًا this Ummah, you're going, to you're going to follow the Yahud and the Nasara in everything that they did. 
everything, if they were to go into a lizard's hole, you, the people from this ummah, will go into a lizard's hole. If one of them were to make zina in the street with his mother, they're going to be people from this ummah who are going to do the same thing, showing how tenaciously we're going to follow and do and fall into what Ahlul Kitab fell into. As for the Muslim, he has to worship Allah with basira. As I mentioned in that ayah, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمِنِ اتَّبَعَنِي Tell them, Ya Muhammad, tell your community, tell everyone, this is my way, this is my religion. I worship Allah with basira, with ilm. I know what I'm doing. Me and those who follow me. The only Muslim who makes taqlid legitimately and is halal is the Muslim who doesn't know something is too big for him, so he's allowed to make taqlid. Allah Ta'ala told us in the Quran, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلِ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ So if a person doesn't know something, he goes to an imam, the imam of the masjid, a mufti, but it has to be an imam of the sunnah, not the imam of shirk, not the imam of bid'ah, not the imam of khurafat, not the imam who steals the money, not the imam who's an alim of su. He goes to a good person, he asks him the question, is this halal, is this halal, haram? I'm just a regular person, I'm a farmer, I don't have any knowledge. The imam says halal. The farmer is not going to say what's the dalil. Many times the farmer he can't read, he can't write. Even the person who's intelligent and he's educated, maybe the issue is too big for him. He wants to know, can I buy this house? Is this mortgage permissible? Is it riba? Is it halal haram? He doesn't have fiqh of all of these issues. So he goes to an imam who has taqwa, who has deen. He says to that imam, what's the ruling? Halal haram? The imam says halal. Because he trusts that imam, he follows him because the issue is too big. But to follow someone in everything that he says, everything that he does, no matter who he is, the only individual that we follow unconditionally, indiscriminately is Al-Mustafa Al-Mukhtar Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because he's the only human being that's ma'asum. We don't blindly follow Abu Bakr. We don't blindly follow Umar. We don't blindly follow Uthman. We don't blindly follow Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhumah, anhum. So if we don't blindly follow them, then what's the condition with blindly following Al-Imam Malik, Al-Imam Abu Hanif, Al-Imam Shaf, Al-Imam Ahmed, Rahimahumullah. I don't want anyone to come and say, here this guy is putting down those companions. This guy is putting down those Imams. I say, La Wallahi. Those Imams, they said to, them, to their students, La Tuqalliduni. Don't blindly follow me. And Imam Malik told his people, every human being, his words are accepted or rejected, except the one who's in that grave, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Imam Abu Hanifa, he was sitting, he was giving his talk. One of his main students, his name is Abu, ya- Abu, Abu Yusuf. He said, Wayhak ya Yaqub. His name was Yaqub, Abu Yusuf. He said, Wayhak ya Yaqub. Don't write everything that I say. I'm a human being. I'm a bashar. Today I say something, tomorrow I change my mind. I change my position because different delil comes to me. It goes to show it's not permissible to blindly follow anyone. Look at the evil of blindly following and why I said that this is an issue that mushrikun fall into. Just look at the evil. There's an ayat and an incident that every Muslim knows about, the culture. Allah Ta'ala said about Quraysh, the mushrikun of Quraysh, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحْدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى ظَلَّ وَجْهُهُ مُسْوَدًّا وَهُوَ كَذِيمٌ يَتَوَارَى مِنَ الْقَوْمِ مِنْ سُوءِ مَا بُشِّرَ بِهِ أَيُمْسِكُهُ عَلَى عَرَهُونًا أَمْ يُدُسُّهُ فِي التُّرَابِ أَلَا أَسَاءَ مَا يَحْكُمُونَ Allah said about the Quraysh, if one of their wives gave birth to a baby, and it was a baby girl, and then the people told the man, hey, you had a baby girl. His face becomes black with grief. He becomes upset that his wife gave birth to a baby girl. And then he starts to hide from the people. He's embarrassed to be seen by his friends. He's embarrassed to be seen by his relatives because he had a baby girl. Allah said he starts to think, should I keep her alive and be in despair and disrespected? Or should I bury her in the ground? Allah said it was an evil thing that they decided to do. They went and they buried them in the ground. Now this is the issue. Just imagine you people who have daughters. 
I have six daughters. You have daughters. You look at your daughter, your wife carried her for nine months. The daughter came out, had nothing to do with you, nothing to do with, the do with your wife, had nothing to do with the daughter. She came out, she has beautiful eyes, long hair, beautiful skin. The father of Quraysh would take that daughter and bring her in the desert, make a hole, and then put the girl in the desert and put the dirt over the daughter. Now, if you were to say to one of them, Hey, Abu Lahab, hey, Abu Jahl, why did you do that to the girl? She was beautiful. Why did you do that? His answer is going to be, That's what my father used to do. I did it because my father used to do it. He's not going to give any intelligent answer. And every group of Muslims are like that. Here I'm visiting this blessed city of Jakarta in Indonesia. The Indonesian people, they have cultural traits. Some Indonesian Muslims, Muslims, they make dua to mountains, they make dua to the tree, they make dua to someone who's dead in the grave. If you were to say to them, why are you doing that? They say, this is what my mother and my father did. They don't say Allah said that in the Quran. They said, this is what my mother and my father did. And for this reason, the great scholar of Islam, Shaykh al-Islam, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, he said that a taqlid is from the usul of al-jahiliyyah. It's from the usul of al-jahiliyyah. It's from the things that the mushrikun used to do. When the Nabi came to the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Qulu la ilaha illallah. They said, la. We're not going to say la ilaha illallah. Why not? They said, because my fathers didn't do that. My fathers didn't say that. My mother, who's a non-Muslim, she's a Christian. When I give a dawah ilallah, I say, become a Muslim, ummi. Say, la ilaha illallah. She says, no. I say, Isa ibn Allah. I say, where's the delil? She said, there's no delil, there's no proof. But this is what my father and my mother did. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was giving dawah to his uncle, Abu Talib. And he said to Abu Talib, Ya Ammi, qul la ilaha illallah kalimatan uhaj Allahu biha yawm al-qiyamah. Just say, la ilaha illallah. I'm going to get you into Jannah. He didn't make salat. He didn't give zakat. He didn't do anything. But he helped al-Islam. He protected the Nabi. The Nabi told him, Ya Ammi, just say, la ilaha illallah. I'm going to argue with Allah. You're going to go to Jannah. He looked, he saw some of the evil people, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl. He said, no, I'm going to follow the religion of my forefathers. A taqlid is from what mushrikun do. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ اِتَّبِئُ مَا أَنزَلَ اللَّهِ قَالُوا بَلْ نَتَّبِئُ مَا أَلْفَيْنَ عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا أَوَلَوْ كَانَ آبَاءَهُمْ لَا يَعْقِلُونَ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَهْتَدُونَ When it is said to them, Abu Lahab, Abu Jahl, Umayy ibn Khalif, when it is said to them, follow what Allah revealed, follow the Quran, follow the Sunnah, the Kuffar of Quraysh said, no, we're going to follow what our fathers were doing. Allah said, even though their fathers, la yaqilun, wa la yahtadun, they don't have any knowledge, they can't read and write, they don't know what they were doing. Don't follow your mothers and your fathers in those things that go against the deen. That doesn't mean that we reject everything that our mothers and fathers do. No. Our mothers and fathers, they passed on to us al-Islam. So we're going to take that Islam. Our mothers and fathers, they passed on to us respecting the elders. We're going to take that from our mothers and fathers. Our mothers and fathers, they passed on to our daughters, for an example, to the women. They passed on to us how to respect the husband, how to be clean, how to be a person who has sharaf and izzah. We're going to take those from the mother and the father. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered in the Quran that we should follow the urf. We should follow the urf, the customs that are positive. So the point here is a taqlid al-a'ma. It is one of the characteristics of the mushrikun. Another category of people who make a taqlid are the people who are the Yahud and the Nasara. Those people who say Uzair is the Ibn of Allah, the Yahud. Those people who say Al-Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, is the son of Allah, the Nasara. They follow those things only because it's blind following. The picture, the image that they give about Isa ibn Maryam being a Caucasian man with blonde hair and blue eyes, there's no delil for that. As a matter of fact, 
in the Bible that they have right now, in their Bible right now, the description of Isa ibn Maryam is, he was a man who had bronze skin. He was closer to my color than he is to white people's color. He is closer to the color of Indonesian people than he is to Caucasians. It said that his hair was woolly like the sheep. Woolly, not straight hair like the hair of the people where he comes from, the people of Palestine. If I said to my mother, Ummi, Ummi, look, in your Bible, in your Bible, it, it gives a picture and an image of Isa that's different from the one you believe in. She's going to say, I know it's different, but this is what my mother and my father used to do. Allah Ta'ala mentioned this phenomenon in the Quran in Surah At-Tawbah. He said, the Jews and the Christians, they take their monks and their priests. They take their rabbis as lords along with Allah. Rabs, ilah, gods along with Allah. There was a companion. He came to the Nabi before he accepted Al-Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His name was Hatim At-Ta'i. Hatim At-Ta'i. His father was one of the well-known people and personalities of Al-Jahiliya. Hatim, he came to the Nabi as a Christian and then the Nabi started giving him da'wah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had a cross around his neck. The Prophet started giving him da'wah to la ilaha illallah. The man accepted al-Islam, him and his sister. Him and his sister. After embracing al-Islam, the Prophet told him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alqi an unukik sanam al-jahiliyyah. He said, take the idol of jahiliyyah off of you. This is a sanam of jahiliyyah. The man took it off and he threw it away. It's not permissible for a Muslim to wear a cross, even if he doesn't believe in it. It's not permissible for a Muslim to sell a cross, even if he doesn't believe in him. It's not permissible for a Muslim to put a tattoo on his arm, on his body of a cross, even if he doesn't believe in it. The Nabi says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it was a sanam of jahiliyyah. Aisha radiallahu anha said, if anything was in the house of the Prophet وسلم, anything and it was shaped like a cross there's a stick that looks like a cross no one brought a cross in the house of the Nabi but if something had a cross she said if the Prophet saw anything shaped like a cross in his house he would break it clearly he didn't bring it in his house clearly none of his people brought it in the house but just imagine some child brought into the house a toy it had the shape of a cross the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam would break it because it is the sanam of al jahiliya the nabi started talking to that companion hatim he read this ayat the yahud and the nasara they take their priests and their monks as arbab and mindunillah guys laws the man said ya rasulullah we didn't worship them. We didn't take them as objects of worship. We didn't make sajda to them, prostration, rukur. We didn't bow to them. We didn't make ibadah to them. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, didn't they make halal what Allah made haram? And you listen to them? They say, yes. He said, didn't they make haram what Allah made halal? And you listen? He said, yes. He said, tilka ibadatukum iyahum. That was the worship that you did to those people. And this is one of the problems with the Muslims. Sometimes we find, as I mentioned earlier, it is permissible for the Muslim to blindly follow when he doesn't know. When he doesn't know, he can blindly follow. He can blindly follow. But when he knows that the Dalil is saying something and his Imam is saying something else, he can't follow the Imam. He can't follow the Imam. For an example, when you make Salat, Raf'ul Yadain. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to do Raf'ul Yadain in the Salat. A person is on a madhab where they don't do Raf'ul Yadain because Al Imam Abu Hanifa said, don't do Raf'ul Yadain. You bring him the Dalil from Bukhari, Muslim Abu Dawood, the Nabi did Raf'ul Yadain. He says, no, I'm not going to do that because Al Imam Abu Hanifa, he must have known. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. This is not permissible. If the Dalil goes against the Imam. You have to follow what the Dalil says. And that's what Imam Abu Hanifa said. He said, Rahimullahu ta'ala, إِذَا صَحَّ الْحَدِيثُ فَهُوَ مَذْهَبِي If the hadith is sahih, then that's my madhab. That's my madhab. So Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, 
all of them, they said something that was correct and they said something that was wrong. And that's because the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is clear. Kullu bani Adam khatta'un wa khayru khatta'een tawwabun. All of Adam's children, they make mistakes. And when they make, the best of those who make mistakes are the ones who repent after their mistakes. Every human being is not ma'asum except the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. Look what the Nabi said in Sahih al-Bukhari. Two groups of people make taqlid al-a'ma, the mushrikeen and ahlul kitab. Look what the Nabi said in Sahih al-Bukhari. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, لو آمن بيا عشرة من اليهود لا آمن بيا اليهود كلهم If ten Jews, ten Yehudi people believed in me, if ten of them believed in me, then all of the Yehud would have believed in me. What's the meaning of this hadith? And this is why it's important that we turn back and we look at the explanation of the books of Al-Hadith. Sahih al-Bukhari, the best explanation of Sahih al-Bukhari that we have today is a book called Fath al-Bari that was written by Al-Hafid ibn Hajj al-Asqalani. There's another book called Fath al-Bari that is actually better than Ibn Hajj al-Asqalani's Fath al-Bari, but it wasn't complete. And it was written by Al-Imam Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, who was one of the students of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah, Rahimahumullah ta'ala, al-Shahid. They said about this hadith, the meaning of the hadith, if ten Yehud believed in me, then all of the Yehud would believe in me. The meaning is, if ten of the leaders of the Yehud believed in me. Because clearly, there were more than ten Yehud who believed in the Nabi. There were a number of Yehud who became Muslims. His wife, Sophia bintu Huyay, she was a Yehudiyah. The great ulama, the alim from the Yehud, Abdullah ibn Salam. He was from the Yehud, Kaab al-Ahbar. These people were Jews. More than ten Jews believed in the Nabi and they were Muslims with him. No doubt about that. So what did he mean by this statement? He meant sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam, if ten of the ulama of the Yehud believed in him, then all of the Yehud would have believed in him because the Yehud are people who make a taqlid al-a'ma. They blindly follow their leaders. So the point here, ikhwani, is we have to be a group of people who follow the proofs. If you have the ability to follow the proof, then you have to follow the proof. Allah has given us an intellect. And the intellect is one of the tremendous favors that Allah bestowed upon us. As He said in the Quran, in many, 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 many ayat, Alam yaj'allahu aynayn wa lisanan wa shafatayn. Didn't we give him two eyes? Didn't we give him two eyes? We gave him two lips, we gave him a tongue so that he can know the right from the wrong. That's the ni'mah of the intellect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, ayat upon ayat, mentioning these types of issues, making it clear that Allah ta'ala has bestowed these alat and these adawat that allow us, these utensils that allow us to understand and comprehend what's going on around us. He subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned wa ja'ala وَجَعَلَ اللَّهُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَةِ He made for him the ability to hear, the ability to see. He gave him a heart so that he can reflect. But unfortunately, the vast majority of people, they don't use these adawat, they don't use these alat in order to use them in a way that's going to bring khayr to them. People have eyes, people have ears, Muslims have hearts. But we don't reflect them, we don't use them in a way that Allah Ta'ala wants them to be used. وَلَقَدْ ذَرَعْنَا لِجَهَنَّمْ كَثِيرًا مِّنَ الْجِنِّ وَالْإِنسِ لَهُمْ قَلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ أَبْصَارٌ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ بِهَا وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا أُولَٰئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلُّ هُمْ أَضَلُّ Allah Ta'ala mentioned, Verily we have prepared the Jahannam for many, many of the jinn and the ins, mankind. They have hearts that they don't reflect with. They don't use their brains, their hearts. They have eyes that they don't see with. They have ears that they don't listen with. They are worse astray than the animals. If you said to the animal, why are you doing this and why are you doing that? 
the cow, the monkey, the sheep, the chicken, they're not going to be able to say anything. They won't be able to reply with anything, anything that's tangible. They may make a sound of an animal, but it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't answer your question. Some human beings are like that. Why are you worshiping a mountain? Why are you doing this shirk? Why are you wearing this thing to protect you from the aim, the evil eye or seher? Why are you doing that? The answer is going to be the answer that the animal gives. He doesn't know why. It doesn't make sense. Another third category that we want to mention concerning the two categories that do a taqlid and they follow a taqlid al-a'ma religiously are the munafiqeen as well. The munafiqeen, the hypocrites. They want to get benefit wherever there is benefit, irregardless to which group he finds that benefit with. So we can't fail to mention them because the munafiq is the individual who on the inside, he's saying one thing, but on the outside, he's doing another thing. If a person was a real Muslim, a real mu'min, when the dalil comes to him, he follows the dalil, he follows the proof. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swore in the ayahs of the Qur'an and he established in the Qur'an he says, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Wala rabbika la yu'minun hatta yuhakkimuka fi ma shajara bayno. You, you, Muhammad, these people, they are not true believers until they cause you to be the judge in what these issues that they have between them. Allah ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Wa in tanaza'tum fi shayin farudduhu ila Allahi wa rasul wa ila rasul in kuntum tu'minun billahi wa yawm al-akhir. If there's anything that you don't know about, you have ikhtilaf about, refer it back to Allah and refer it back to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if you are truly believers. Allah ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Ittabi'u ma unzila ilaykum min rabbikum wa la tattabi'u min dunihi awliya. Follow what was revealed to you from your Lord. Follow the Quran and follow the Sunnah. The Quran was revealed by Allah and the Sunnah was revealed by Allah. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah inni utitul Quran wa mithluhu ma'ahu. Verily I was given the Quran and what is similar to the Quran. So the ulama of al hadith, the ulama of al Islam, they used to say and they used to believe, Jibreel. Salawatullahi wasalamuhu alayhi. He used to come down to the Nabi with the Quran and he used to come down to the Nabi with the Sunnah. Salawatullahi wasalamuhu alayhi. So Allah Ta'ala mentioned in that ayah, He mentioned, follow what Allah revealed, the Quran and the Sunnah. And don't follow the awliya. Don't follow those people who you consider to be awliya. Look what happened, Ikhwani, look what happened. This is very, very important. One time, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, some people asked him, and he's the mufti, he's the scholar from the companions. They said, what's the best type of hajj to perform? There are three types of hajj you can perform. Al-Tamattu' al-Iqran and al-Ifrat. He said, they said, what's the best hajj to perform? He said the best hajj to perform is a tamattu' The hajj in which the person makes umrah and then he comes out of his clothes and then when hajj begins, he puts his ihram on again. That's a tamattu' And there are dalil from the Prophet wasallam that tamattu' is the best. But the Nabi didn't do a tamattu' But he said it was the best hajj to perform. So Ibn Abbas told them the best hajj to perform is a tamattu' And he gave them the dalil why. The people said, but Abu Bakr and Umar, they didn't say that. He said, Allahu Akbar. I tell you that the Prophet Sallallahu said something and you tell me, Abu Bakr and Umar. He said, I'm going to get up and get out of this city. I'm going to leave this Medina because I'm afraid that some rocks will come from the sky and Allah will destroy you people. That's Abu Bakr and Umar. What about Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Ahmed, Imam Malik? They not equal to Imam Abu Bakr, they're not equal to Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu. Look, 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 look at the companions. The tarbiyah that the Nabi gave the companions. That's Abdullah ibn Abbas. He was young. Another youngster, Zayd ibn Thabit. He was the one who Abu Bakr and Umar, they came to him during the khilaf of Abu Bakr. There was a war, jihad. Many of the Qurra, who father of the Quran, they were killed. Umar radiallahu anhu the alim, he came, he said, Ya Abu Bakr, we have to do something about the Quran. Because if we keep making jihad, 
and the people get killed, the Quran is going to be lost. Abu Bakr said, yes, that's a good idea. Abu Bakr is an alim, alim, then Umar, but the more knowledge you have, the more willing you're going to embrace good ideas. They said, okay, let's choose Zayd ibn Thabit because he used to write the wahi for the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because he's half of the Quran. Because he's young. He's nasheed. They went to him. They said, hey, we want you, Zayd ibn Thabit, to bring the Quran together and make it into a book. Make it into a mushaf. Who said that to him? Abu Bakr and Umar. And he was young. When they gave him this idea, Zayd ibn Thabit said, Wallahi, I'm not going to do anything that the Prophet didn't do. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, Wallahi, I'm not going to do anything that the Prophet didn't do, Abu Bakr and Umar. If the Quran was going to be a mushaf, the Prophet would have did it. I'm not doing that. He thought it was a bid'ah. He thought it was, I'm not doing that. Abu Bakr and Umar, they didn't get mad at him. They didn't start beating him up. They said, hey, hey, take it easy. They have to bring the dalil. They said, didn't Allah say in the Quran, Alif la meem, thalik al kitab la riba fi? And they started giving the ayat of the Quran in which Allah called the Quran a kitab. And then they made the dalil from the sunnah. The Nabi, the, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told the people, la yusafiranna ahadukum ila ard al udu ma al mushaf. None of you should travel to the land of the enemy with a mushaf. And he called it the Mus'haf. Because if you take the Quran, the Mus'haf, to a place where it's going to be disrespected, like the soldiers in Iraq, the American soldiers, they step on the Mus'haf, they throw it into the toilet, Akramakum Allah. The Muslim himself, our children, write on the Mus'haf. When the pages get ripped up, we throw it in the street. We get the newspaper and the Quran, the ayat written on the pages of the newspaper, and we use it to eat food on. We throw it in the garbage. We throw it in the bin. Nah, the Quran has to be respected. And that's why Uthman ibn Affan, عنه, when he had all of the Qurans given to him, he burnt them to get rid of it in a respectful way. You can't throw the Mus'haf and the pages and ayat of the Quran in the garbage. A shahid min al kalam. A shahid. When they gave him this dalil, those ayat that the Quran is a kitab, the Nabi called it a mushaf, he became convinced, muqtani'. He said, yes, I agree. He said, and then I began to go and bring the Quran together. He said, wallahi, wallahi. If they would have asked me to move the Jabal of al-Uhud, to move Uhud from there to over there, it would have been easier to do than what they were telling me to do. Bring the Quran together. So the point is, and I'm finished here, do you see how the young man, he didn't do something just because the two people who were older than him, the two people more knowledgeable than him, the two people who there's even Dalil. The Nabi says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, iqtadu billadhini min ba'di. Abi Bakr wa Umar, follow the two people after me, Abu Bakr and Umar. The Nabi said, alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al-khulafa al-rashidin al-mahdiyin min ba'di. Addu alayhi bin nawajid, take the sunnah of the khulafa al-rashidin. Even with those Dalils, Zayd ibn Thabit didn't say, they're ma'soon. He said, Wallahi, I'm not going to do something that the Nabi didn't do. And this is what we as parents have to give the tarbiyah of our children upon. Let your child grow up being a person who loves the Sunnah, a person who's from Ahl Sunnah. He wants to protect the Sunnah. He doesn't want to be a person of bid'ah and shirk and khurafat. Ask Allah Ta'ala by His Ism and Adham to give us the tawfiq to plant our feet firmly on the Sunnah and to make us those people from the Ansar of the Sunnah and the people of Ahl Sunnah. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله